Following decades of repression and autocratic rule, uprisings in North Africa and throughout the Arab world have upended the status quo, ushering in a new political era, now known as the Arab Spring. This is probably the most positive development in this region in my lifetime. How will this revolutionary moment affect American objectives in the Middle East? The hardest part at the moment is how to translate the street into governance. After the Arab Spring, next on Great Decisions. In a democracy, agreement is not essential, but participation is. Foreign policy is actually not foreign, uh, and it is very much connected to every American's daily life. It is crucial for our democracy that our citizens understand what our challenges are. We can either choose to deliberately influence the shape of international events, or we can sit on the sidelines and let someone else shape those events. We have to study. We have to listen carefully. We have to be critical in our judgments about what we hear. There is not any issue that happens abroad that doesn't affect Americans directly. A kind of global commons has been created in security and economic terms. And the United States has taken the leading role in creating it. The ultimate test is to move our society from where it is to where it has never been. And that requires the participation of informed, committed, and concerned citizens. We need to shape a balance of power that favors freedom for our prosperity, for our security, and for the future of our children. A lot of people don't realize that the uh, final arbiter of uh, policy in our democracy is the will of the American people. We're counting on you to tell the leaders of your country what you want to see happen with the foreign policy of the United States of America. With more countries facing common challenges, we have the chance and the profound responsibility to exercise American leadership to solve our problems, and wherever we can, in concert with others. Join us as we discuss today's most critical global issues. Join us for Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association, inspiring Americans to learn more about the world. Great Decisions is produced in association with the University of Delaware. Sponsorship of Great Decisions is provided by Credit Suisse, ENI, the Hereford Foundation, and Price Waterhouse Coopers LLP. Coming up next, after the Arab Spring. Welcome to Great Decisions. I'm Ralph Begleiter. Joining us this week to discuss the impact of the Arab Spring on U.S. foreign policy are Shadi Hamid, director of research at the Brookings Doha Center and a fellow at the Saban Center for Middle East Policy, and Mona El Tahawi, award winning columnist and an international public speaker on Arab and Muslim issues. Thanks to both of you for being with us. Nice to be here. What's it going to do for the United States, the Arab Spring, the uprisings there? How is the United States going to have to change its view of the Middle East? Mona? Well, I think the United States has finally caught on to the idea that it's been definitely far behind the people of the region because it was too firmly allied with the dictators of the region. For too long, it bought into this lie that the dictators were the only guarantors of stability. And in, and in return for that, it turned a blind eye to what it knew was the repression and human rights violations that these dictators enacted upon their countries. So I think we've seen the United States scramble to try to catch up with the reality on the ground. And what I hope it does to the United States is that it puts human rights and a respect for human rights and freedom and dignity for the people squarely on the table as a, human, as a foreign um, policy objective and as something that the United States reminds its allies of the importance of in the region. Shadi, how about you, the, the, the impact for the United States? It was late to the game with Mubarak, with Ben Ali in Tunisia, um, Syria, the list goes on. So there's still a big question here. Can the U.S. get ahead of the curve and proactively support democracy in the region? And I think the answer so far seems to be no. And the U.S. is still very concerned about stability. We have to be honest about it. Democracy can have a destabilizing effect. And we've seen that in Egypt, for example, with the mob attack on the Israeli embassy over the summer, uh, where, you know, um, people are angry and democracies have to be responsive to the will of the people. And that means there's going to be a lot more anti-American, anti-Israeli sentiment 
affecting these countries' foreign policy. Let's take a look back a little bit at the past 30 years or so. We've talked with a number of other experts about this subject. Let's listen to what they have to say for just a moment. People have been living without basic freedoms, the freedom to organize political parties, the freedom to express yourself, to demonstrate, to be and to do what you want. But also on top of it, the socioeconomic conditions, deprivation, corruption, injustice, poverty, and the mix of the two has they, people have been living with in some parts of the Arab world for decades. The Arab world uh, was seen as somehow uh, different uh, than the rest of the world. There was even a phrase that political scientists use called Arab exceptionalism to try to explain why democracy could advance in all these other cultures but not in the Arab Middle East. The problem is that in the short run, the stability always prevailed over the need for change. Yes, in the long run, we have to have change. But let's not rock the boat right now, which was really always what happened in terms of the U.S. policy. Governments, of course, knew that and they preempted the emergence of any effective political organization or social organization or individuals. Uh, and for that reason, people were pessimistic about the public asserting itself. The great logjam in Middle Eastern politics, the frozen nature of the uh, regional system, which has been stuck in sclerotic tyranny for decades, has finally uh, been broken and is starting to crack. And this is the most exciting development in global politics in the last several years, absolutely without a doubt. Let me pick up on what Marina Ottaway uh, said there. Don't rock the boat was the U.S. policy, basically, for the last several decades. Uh, Shadi, did the United States make a mistake by taking a don't rock the boat uh, policy? It was an utter failure, this stability paradigm, because right now, look at the situation that the U.S. is in. It's caught unaware. And, and we, have to, we have to remember that autocracies don't last forever. Sooner or later, they're going to fall. But the U.S. convinced itself that somehow this durable autocratic condition would con continue indefinitely. But it's interesting that this shouldn't have been so much of a surprise because um, President Bush and Condoleezza Rice in 2005, 2006 would say the status quo is untenable and the status quo was untenable. So we knew this was going to happen, but we weren't prepared to face that reality. They weren't the only ones who predicted that. The U.S., in some ways, you could say this is what the U.S. has been wishing for, isn't it, for many decades in the Middle East. The U.S. has made arguments about democracy and uh, exportation throughout the region. Mona, why was the U.S. so surprised by this? You know, it's quite astounding why the U.S. didn't see it coming and why the U.S. for decades would lecture and preach all these countries about human rights violations and, and the need for freedom and the need for democracy. And yet, at the same time, prop up these very same regimes that stood in the way of all of those things. You know, at the end of the day, we also have to be honest and say there was this ridiculous stereotype about people in the, in the Middle East and North Africa, which everybody wanted to buy, which was that we, the people of that region, love our pharaoh in Egypt, for example. We love our strong-armed dictator like Saddam. So, you know, when Saddam Hussein was toppled, oh, we have to find another Saddam for Iraq. And it was just ludicrous. The fact that this Arab exceptionalism, as we heard, kept being bandied around was the ultimate insult to the people of the region. The people in the region are human beings like everywhere else who deserve freedom and dignity and deserve a much better foreign policy from a country like the United States like, that prides itself on um, human rights and the respect of human rights and freedom. So to think this and, and, and to see that stereotype being smashed by largely non-violent revolutions and uprisings has been one of the most exciting episodes of my life and many lives. Let me ask you this, though. Over these years, when the dictators and autocrats of the region have effectively prevented the Arab people from developing institutions, as you've both mentioned, uh, that would lend themselves to democracy, how can we expect a people who've never tasted democracy in their own societies to suddenly overnight establish it? It seems an unreasonable expectation. Well, democracy is something you learn by doing. You can have people lecture to you about it for, for decades, but you have to start practicing it yourself. You have to go to the ballot box. You have to join a political party. So these sorts of things can only happen if that initial opening takes place, and that's what we're seeing now. And it's interesting that Arabs do seem to have a knack for democracy. Whenever they have the chance, they vote in large numbers. In Libya, you had the Libyan rebels self-governing in many parts of the country after never having a chance to do that for four, uh, for four decades. So I think we've seen that when Arabs have the chance, they'll rise to the occasion. But we also have to be honest and say, it's going to be messy. 
It's going to be uncertain. It might even be bloody, as it is in many places right now. So I think we have to have realistic expectations. This is a long-term process. If you had a chance to write a prescription for the U.S. government during the transition period now, what should the U.S. government be doing with or for the people of the Middle East to enable them to make the transition Shadi was just talking about? Well, I think, you know, that there are certain basic steps it can take in, in countries like Egypt, in Libya, in countries where the r uprisings and revolutions have begun their first steps. I, I wouldn't say that they've, they're, they're complete. I think revolutions take years to complete. Ending emergency law, for example, is, is one, one, one thing that many countries are struggling with in Egypt. Is some, Egypt had it for more than 30 years. Um, but what can the U.S. do about that? Well, push its allies. I mean, the United States is still remains very good friends with the Supreme Military Council that the, or remained good friends with the Supreme Military Council in Egypt, which took over um, the power after Mubarak was forced to step down. It gives up to 40 percent of the Egyptian military its budget. It has leeway in that way. It can use that and say, you know, if you want us to continue being good friends, this is what we expect of good friends. Shadi, other ideas? Well, here, the basic reality is that the U.S. has leverage. We have been for decades the primary donor and funder of countries like Egypt, Morocco, Jordan, the list goes on. So these are our allies, right? So we should use that leverage to push them towards real democracy. But my concern is that the Obama administration has been very reticent to put that kind of pressure on these regimes to the point where I don't think governments now in the Arab world really feel um, that they have to take Obama seriously. And I think the U.S. has lost credibility here, and that makes it much more difficult to affect change. So I think at the end of the day, the Obama administration has to adopt a stronger, tougher approach and say, these are our red lines. Let's listen to some of our other experts on this topic as well as the region goes through this transition. When Mohamed Bouazizi, you know, you know, burned himself in protest against his mistreatment in Tunisia and it set off these protests, it really took people by surprise. But once it happened uh, and started gathering steam, uh, I think then uh, gradually people realized that something very significant was at stake here. Without the need for political parties, without the need for social organizations, without the need for charismatic political or social leaders, you've had an almost spontaneous uprising that was effective and already toppled two governments and, and perhaps more. Uh, and, and that clearly is what's new. And that is why it's an Arab awakening and discovering that you have a power to do something on your own. The issue that's so interesting about it, it's not an American story. It is not like people have tried to compare it to Central and Eastern Europe, very different. The people in Central and Eastern Europe wanted to be embraced by the West, by us or Western Europe. Um, and they wanted to be part of the EU or NATO. Or, and what we're seeing in the Arab world is um, a desire to be themselves. This empowerment, if it's, not allowed, if it's not allowed to succeed in its peaceful way, could turn into a nightmare of militancy. And that is really a national security issue. A nightmare of militancy. Is that something you would imagine uh, emerging in the region after decades of stability under autocracies there, Mona? It's not something I imagine. I think what we're seeing, what we saw uh, from the end of 2010 through 2011, is a clear indication that the people of the Middle East and North Africa had rejected militancy and were choosing largely peaceful ways by which they could change their regimes. I think the frustration is dangerous and it's important to listen to people. And you see the frustration, especially in countries like Yemen and Bahrain, that have not been so successful as, um, say, Egypt, Tunisia and Libya in forcing regimes to either change or temporarily change. And you see it in those countries, especially with the hypocrisy of U.S. foreign policy, because when you look like a, uh, when you look at a country like Bahrain, where the U.S. has its fifth Navy fleet and where the U.S. is worried about Iranian influence and it's a great ally of Saudi Arabia, which sent tanks into Bahrain, what are you then going to tell Bahrainis who have used largely peaceful means to express their desire for freedom and dignity, which they have been doing for years, much longer than these uprisings and revolutions? What then do they do when they're frustrated at every end and the United States continues to ignore them?
Shadi, maybe a comment on the militancy, the nightmare of militancy? Yeah, I mean, this is the real risk, that people go out and they protest peacefully and all of that, but when they feel that their demands aren't being addressed, at some point they're going to consider taking up arms. We saw that, obviously, in Libya, where people felt a need to defend themselves, but also in Syria, where you see, in some aspects, a militarization of the opposition. We heard Madeleine Albright say that this was not an American story, unlike the uh, events in former Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Union. This is not a U.S. story. But in some respects, it is a U.S. story. The, from our perspective, the U.S. has to find a way to respond to the events going on in the region. Can the U.S. find a single policy, Shadi, that, that addresses all of the range from Bahrain, as Mona mentioned, to Tunisia, to Syria, to Saudi Arabia? People keep on saying, it's not about us, it's not about us. Well, you know what? It partly is because we were supporting these autocracies for almost five decades. So we're part of the problem here, and we have to reassess and look inward. In terms of what we do about that, the case-by-case -case approach that the Obama administration is adopting is not going to be effective. There has to be a grand strategy. There has to be a vision, and there has to be consistency. As Mona talked about, you know, we took a pro-democracy approach in Egypt, but not so much on Bahrain. And it took you know, more than five months and more than 2,000 people killed in Syria for, the, for President Obama to say, Assad has to go. So these are troubling signs. So the U.S. has to, I think, offer something bigger and have a more ambitious approach, a bolder approach. But the Obama administration used military power in Libya, didn't use it in Egypt, didn't use it in Tunisia, I don't think would dare to use it in Saudi Arabia or Bahrain. Uh, Mona, what's the role of military power here? I think the people in the region are sick and tired of having any kind of military role for the United States, especially after Iraq. And, and so they're especially allergic to hearing, as some from the former Bush administration say, oh, Iraq got the ball rolling. I think that's probably why the United States was so hesitant to become involved with the Libya scenario. But, but the U.S. joined Libya militarily as part of NATO. It was, it was a very different play and it was a very different scenario than the intervention, the, the invasion of Iraq, in that the United States went in as part of the international community. The Libyans were calling on the international community to come in. So I think it's wise that the U.S. does, when it can, avoid any kind of military intervention in that part of the world, because people are sick and tired of it. But as Shadi mentioned, in Syria, for how long are we now, the international community, including the U.S., going to watch as Assad slaughters people who have largely been nonviolent? So I think this is where the international community and the Obama administration's um, uh, stress on listening to the Security Council and listening to what the world wants of the U.S. and listen to the people on the ground. Let's take a look forward now a little bit to challenges facing the U.S. in the next few years as the aftermath of the Arab Spring unfolds. Let's listen to what some of our other experts have to say. It's very much in the interest of our country to try to help these uh, struggling post-revolutionary governments to find a free and democratic future rather than a future of extremism or authoritarianism. I have said all along, uh, democracy has to deliver. People want to vote and eat. And so there has to be a way that some of the economic development takes place so that those um, alienated or disenfranchised young people have the capability of being a part of their new economic situation. We've picked a winner in what was essentially a Libyan civil war. And now we have got to help this winning side build a better life for, for the Libyan people. And it's not pure democracy, Jeffersonian democracy, democracy as we know it, but we've accepted a responsibility to help them build a more responsive, more transparent government than Libya has ever known. So it puts the U.S. in this awkward position of wanting to help, but even as it does so, knowing that it has to walk on, on eggshells because its presence is not always very welcome in the countries in the region. Even if it doesn't turn out incredibly well in the short term, the fact is there's no going back to the old system. And the first step towards bringing the Middle East into broader patterns of development, democratization, what scholars have called the third wave of global democratization, is going to move forward. And that is going to be a fascinating and exciting and challenging thing to watch. An exciting thing to watch for the United States, maybe a little scary. Can either of you comment on what the U.S. could do to guarantee, and I say that with a smile, uh, 
the prospect of friendly governments in these countries that are in going, undergoing revolutions? Well, I think we just have to be straight up about this. They're not going to be particularly friendly. There is going to be a more anti-American slant to these new governments because that, again, is what democracy is about. It's about being responsive to your people. And if your people don't like the U.S. or they don't like Israel, that's going to be part of the foreign policy of the new Egypt of the new Tunisia, of the new Syria. Now, there's ways to manage that to the best of our ability. And, you know, we just have to engage in a dialogue with these new actors. And throughout the region, we're seeing the rise of Islamist groups like the Muslim Brotherhood that are going to be the single most dominant forces in many of these countries. So we have to engage with the Muslim Brotherhood. We have to start a dialogue with them and see whether or not we can develop some influence there and have a re relationship of mutual respect. Mona, do you expect kind of negative reactions to the United States in the coming years as well? I think after decades of taking essentially the wrong side, it, it, I expect nothing short of people being very wary of the U.S. I mean, remember very soon after Mubarak stepped down in 2011, many of the young revolutionaries in Egypt refused to meet with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton because of that, um, you know, because they remember just how supportive the, the various U.S. administrations, five U.S. presidents supported Mubarak. And across the region, whether they were particular allies of the U.S. or not, I mean, Syria wasn't always a, a U.S. ally. Libya wasn't always a U.S. ally. But it's just this idea that, that the United States does have, has interfered often in, in very unwelcome ways. I think the best thing that the U.S. can do is to encourage a, a political platform or various political platforms that allow everybody to speak. Shadi mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood. Undoubtedly, they're important. But there are others in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Syria, in Yemen, in Bahrain, who don't support the Muslim Brotherhood and who demand voices and who deserve to have voices. And I think one of the major mistakes the U.S. had done and should no longer do is to look at the countries as just either or. It's not just a Muslim Brotherhood or whatever they, they're going to replace. It's going to be people of various political leanings and people of various sectarian leanings. And the U.S. can encourage the kind of system we have here in this country, where everybody feels represented and everybody feels that they have a voice that speaks. I want to pick up on something Shadi just mentioned in passing a minute ago, but is very important to the United States. What can we expect in the aftermath of the Arab Spring with regard to these countries' relationships and views about and toward Israel, which is, for better or for worse, a very important policy issue for the United States? You know, if you look across almost every country in the region, there people hate Israel. That, that is the honest answer to it. They hate Israel because of its occupation of Palestinian land. But they don't, his, they don't hate Israel just because. There are things that Israel can do to lessen that hate. And, and for decades, the various regimes in that region would use that hatred of Israel as a distraction to many of the things that were going wrong inside the country. So now that those regimes have inside gone... Inside their own countries. Inside the their own countries. countries. It was very convenient for Hosni Mubarak to maintain the Camp David peace accords or peace treaty with Israel, while at the same time direct this internal rage towards Israel, because he recognizes very well that Egyptians are very sympathetic towards Palestinians, and they hate Israel for its occupation. So I think we have to be very realistic about that, and Israel must recognize that the more right-wing or right-leaning its government gets, the more it's going to feed into that. It has to recognize that it's way beyond time to make concessions to the Palestinians, and it has to recognize that the siege of Gaza and the occupation of Palestinian land must end. With those things in place, yet you can then start thinking about how can the people of the region and Israel perhaps think of a, of a future relationship, but honestly, without an end to occupation and an end to the siege, I don't see how that hatred will end. Shouldn't the Arabs also be concerned about the more leaning toward Muslim Brotherhood or Islamist governments in their countries, the less likely Israel is likely to compromise with them? You, I mean, you can make this argument endlessly. It could be a vicious circle. But I think at the end of the day, no matter what kind of Muslim Brotherhood government we have in Egypt, Israel is also, can also use it as a distraction. Israel can also say, but we don't trust these neighbors. And at the end of the day, what neighbors did Israel trust? It trusted a neighbor like Hosni Mubarak, who was a dictator, who was preventing Egypt from becoming the kind of democracy that Israel would often pride itself on being for its Jewish citizens. So I think this is something that both sides, whether it's the Israeli side or the various Arab sides, must recognize. We must no longer use the external enemy as an excuse to making progress, and we must not use it as an excuse to maintaining the occupation. As we come to a close, I do want to ask you one more question from an American perspective, which is, now that the Arab Spring has occurred and the countries are emerging, some faster, some more slowly, from those uprisings, given the dysfunction inside the U.S. democracy, 
Why should we expect the Arabs to look to the United States and say, ah, that's a great system, we should adopt that system? Um, I think it's interesting that Arabs in their time of need, when they're protesting and dying and fighting for their freedom on the streets, they don't turn to Russia or China. They still turn to the West, and in particular, the U.S. We saw that in Libya, where the Libyan rebels were literally begging the U.S. to get involved and asking, why wasn't the U.S. doing more? And we see that across the board, that people are asking the U.S. to be more supportive of democracy. There's still a sense, you know, Arabs, I think, sometimes have this weird schizophrenia. They, it's a love-hate relationship with the U.S., but part of them still wants to believe that the U.S. can do better. So I think that gives Americans an opening. There's still a role for us to play. Shadi Hamid and Mona El Tahawi, thank you both very much for being with us on Great Decisions. Thank you. And thank you as well for joining us on Great Decisions. I'm Ralph Begleiter. We'll see you next time. To join a discussion group in your area or order a DVD of this series, visit greatdecisions.org or call 1 800 477 5836. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association, inspiring Americans to learn more about the world. Great Decisions is produced in association with the University of Delaware. Sponsorship of Great Decisions is provided by Credit Suisse, ENI, the Hereford Foundation, and Price Waterhouse Coopers LLP. Next time on Great Decisions. Democracy promotion has long been a stated goal of U.S. foreign policy, but following the grassroots uprisings in North Africa and the Middle East, can democracy really be exported? What can the U.S. do to help? Democracy and foreign policy, next time on Great Decisions.